Hey, everybody. In today's episode, it's myself, Ben, and a gentleman by the name of Xander. Xander is on his way out of Rock Recovery Center. Today is, in fact, his last day, and we wanted to bring him on the show to talk to you about his experience while with us. Xander, at first sight, when he came in here, we did not think he was going to be able to make the cut, if you will. He did not present as somebody that was going to be able to stay clean and sober, and he shocked all of us. Xander is one of those ones that he was adamant about being on Suboxone from the day that he got here, and for whatever reason, he decided to stick it out. He knew full well we're an abstinence-based treatment center, and he was willing to give it a shot, and here we are, just over 90 days clean for him, and he says he does not ever want to have to go on Suboxone. We cover all that. We cover so much more. Enjoy the show. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's up, everybody? And we got a gentleman by the name of Xander. Xander, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Good, thank you. First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use. And thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your message to your message right, peeps. Yes, sir. Whew, that was long-winded. Also, go to realrecoverytalk.com, and there you're going to find on the homepage, it says schedule a call. This is a free call. It's going to be 10, 15 minutes, and uh, we're going to... Listen to your situation, see if we can help and assist in any possible way, but you have to go to realrecoverytalk.com and click schedule a call. It is right there. Boom. Right in the middle. Just click it, put your information in, and then you can schedule that up. Also go to realrecoverytalk.com slash guides. There you're going to find a catalog of guides. G-U-I-D-E-S. Realrecoverytalk.com slash guides. Scan the guides, see which one makes sense for you. Download all of them. Actually do what the guides say. And then when you're done with that, go to the homepage and click the schedule a call. And so we can discuss what you found out by doing these assessments that you find in rollrecoverytalk.com slash guides. Also on Facebook. On Facebook, Ben, what do we have on Facebook? (laughs) We have a Facebook group, Tom. What's it called, Ben? The Sobriety Network. The Sobriety Network. Yes, go there. Go to Facebook. Type in the Sobriety Network. And that is our Facebook group. And all is welcome. If you're a drug addict and you're actively using, you're welcome. If you are in recovery, you are welcome. If you're a family member or a loved one of somebody that struggles with addiction, you are welcome. It's the town hall, if you will, of all addiction uh, discussion and alcoholism. Want to make sure we throw love to our fellow drunks out there. Go to Facebook and type in the Sobriety Network. And you'll find it there. Last but not least, if you would love to have a conversation with myself, Ben, or Dr. Tambini for one full hour of our undivided attention, you can find that at realrecoverytalk.com slash services. All you have to do is uh, decide who you want to talk to, make payment, and uh, you have our undivided attention for an hour. That is it. How are we doing? We are good. That was long today. Felt longer. Eh, a little bit. <laughs> What's up, Xander? Nothing much. I'm doing well. Yeah. It was a big day for me. Okay. Um, why so? I'm leaving Rock. Yeah. You know, get I'm, that mic a little bit closer to you. I'm leaving Rock and I'm going back home. And so it, it's bittersweet for sure. You know, I, I'm going to miss Rock quite a bit, but uh, stuff back home is calling. So give us a little backstory of your, uh, you know, what landed you here in the first place. And then we'll go Let from there. Let me ask you this. Before, right before, how long have you been here? Uh, about ninety days. Ninety days. I thought it's Three been months. longer than that. Maybe a little. Too. Maybe a little over. Yeah. yeah. Sure feels like it's been longer. <laughs> how long did you intend on coming for? Um, hundred and twenty days. No, that's not true. No, I remember you being here. <laughs> you almost. Here for you like almost. Two weeks. You were almost yeah. gone the first day. No, yeah, that's right. I came in, almost <laughs> left, like right away. Wasn't having it, fighting back. Why? I, you know, so part of my story is before I came to this uh, facility, I was at a different one and I was using at that facility. So I came in, 
you know, not clear minded, still hesitant on the fence about what I wanted sobriety wise. And um, I just felt like everyone was almost out to get me rehab wise, all the workers, like to catch me. And um, those feelings just made me a little resistant at first. But once I got settled in, you know, I stayed quite a long time, you know, it was a blessing in disguise coming here from where I was. I kind of like that we're starting here. How many times had, had you been to treatment? I want—I do want to go back and look at the history of how, I, but this is a good spot to start, I think, because there's a lot to the beginning of this story when we met you. Right. Yeah. Um, I've been to treatment quite a few times, a handful of times. There's been some where I went for a couple of days, ama so I wouldn't really count those times. AMA means against medical advice for any of our listeners, meaning you... Lack of a better fence. way to jump the fence. Jump the fence, basically. <laughs> I jumped the fence once or twice. Yeah. Um, but I've been in treatment a handful of times, for sure. And I, I kind of want to throw it out there. And literally, I've been joking with Xander about this the entire time he's been here. Like, well, after he got a little came back, too. But um, <laughs> when we first laid eyes on you and you walked in the door, I was like, what is wrong with this kid? I legit, dude, and I am not exaggerating thought you had brain damage you were mumbling you couldn't do complete sentences your even your your hands your 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 legs were shaking yeah it was bad and i was like what is going on here and i remember i pulled your parents aside in the hall and i'm like what is this something is so off right now that's just not adding up do you, you mind touching on some of that yeah so um with the last uh, rehab I was at, Recovery Center, um, I was using for quite a long time, a couple months. And while in there? While in rehab, yeah. And, so uh, let's stop there just for a second because I want to draw attention to that. Just because it's a rehab center doesn't necessarily mean that there's not opportunities to use. Yeah. Okay. Um, definitely, I'm definitely manipulating my way through using while I was there. And um, that's... I eventually got kicked out. You know, eventually they caught on. Couldn't keep it going forever. But I wouldn't admit to anything. They, they didn't have, like, proof, but they, they knew. So I got kicked out, and that's when I came here. Do you mind disclosing what you were doing when you were there that they couldn't catch you? Yeah. So, I think it'd be good for our listeners to hear. Yeah, so it was a couple of things. You know, I was doing Kratom, Kratom. Um, I don't know how familiar you all are with that. It's like, it's like a natural opiate. A big one was Whippets. So whippets are undetectable completely. So I was doing a lot of whippets. Uh, not good for you. <laughs> Definitely kills some yeah. brain cells. I would not have been doing those if I was not in treatment. It was kind of just an easy little trick in treatment to get around drug tests and everything like that. So, uh, yeah, I'll kind of fill the backlog. And this is the importance of honestly having good staff between both clinical and whatever the housing situation is. But you mentioned Kratom. Yeah. And just to be very straightforward, I'm a little dumbfounded that the center didn't catch for that because we drug test for that yeah. here. This, um, they... So neither here nor there at this point. It is what it is. But the, the whippets, specifically, the whippets you were doing in particular was, was nitrous. Nitrous oxide. Yeah. And you were getting it from a head shop. Head shop, yeah. So you go is, in there, they got these big tanks, right? Mm -hmm. And you just screw the nozzle on the top, and you have a whole tank of whippets, nitrous oxide. Good Lord. Yeah. And I was going through multiple of those a day, you know? So basically, like, I mean, I guess it's the nitrous oxide's a safer version because it does have a molecule of oxygen in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it literally, like, depletes your brain of oxygen because it's not the amount of oxygen you're supposed to be getting. And you get that, wah, 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 like your brain shuts down. Yeah, and you pass out. You know, you hold it in long enough, you just wake up. You're like, what just happened? I mean, them things like put you out for like sixty seconds, and then you do it again. Yeah, and again every sixty seconds, like kind of thing. I was breathing more nitrous oxide in than oxygen for a, a good time there. It, it was constant. Like I had tanks this big in the back seat of my car. All, you know. At the end of the day, going back to the rehab, because I had an 11 p.m. curfew, I'd always have to stop and be sneaky about like going to the gas station, throwing 15 tanks away, you know, being discreet about that. So you were in a lower level of care at that point that had some... some IOP. You were in intensive outpatient. So 
at that level of care, you can kind of come and go. Yeah. So I had my car, I had my vehicle. Um, really, all it was was I had group some nights of the week, and then I had 11 p.m. curfew. What was going on in your head when you're doing these? And I mean, when you're awake, I suppose. Does any part of you think like I'm totally just frying my brain right now? 100%. And I got stuck in such a cycle, you know, you're being a drug addict. I'm to the point now where the first one's a choice for me, right? The first one's a choice and I have a defense against the first one, but the second one is not a choice, you know? And I literally could not stop myself from walking in the, the head shop and, you know, doing it constantly. And so I got stuck in that cycle. And that's where, because I knew I was like, this is so bad for me. I'm killing so many brain cells. And I literally kept doing it. I want to bring something up, too, that you, that you said earlier. And I, I re, let me reiterate this. When I thought you had brain damage, like, we didn't know what was going on because we received you from this other facility. Yeah. And they were like, we don't know what's going on. I wouldn't on. admit to nothing. Well, and let's elaborate on that a little bit. All of us, myself, Ben, Nicole, our clinical director, and one of the primary therapists, we're all in here by ourselves debating if we needed to send you to a primary mental health facility because we didn't know what was going on. Yeah. You know, things just weren't like, you know what I mean? That's how out of it you were. So, and mind you, at the time, we didn't know about the massive amounts of nitrous that you were doing and stuff like that. So, you know, but we were willing to go out on a limb and give you a shot. And we're so glad we did. No, we definitely are glad, you know, and, to be straight up, like I, th- I think that's a difference too. Is like our our team in particular, we all communicate so well, dude. Yeah, and like as a team, make decisions. But like to be straight up, it kind of blows my mind. You were in another center for that long, getting away with this. Yeah, when we just meet you on day one, and we're like, whoa, let's get to the bottom of this. Do you mind disclosing how much money you spent on the this nitrous? Because this blew my mind. Ten grand. Ten thousand dollars on nitrous. Yeah, you know, so I came in to rehab. Like this isn't my wasn't my first time, but you know I I always had a good job making good money. So you know I saved up a good amount and spent a lot of money every day on the whippets on all different stuff. But you know, ten grand down the fo- down the hole. That blows my mind. And this this was the part that I wanted to ask you about because you mentioned this earlier. You said, and I love dissecting this that you were only doing the nitrous and kratom because you were in treatment. Yeah. Had you been on the streets, you were alluding to the fact you would have been doing oxys or more of your drug of choice. Fentanyl. But or, and fentanyl. Yeah. But that's the insanity of this thing, dude. And and I'm I can only speak for myself. Don't get me wrong. I've I've worked with thousands of people at this point. Right. So I I've seen this hundreds of times where you've got somebody whose drug of choice is something completely different. Then they come here and try to get away with doing the stuff they think they won't get caught for. A lot of the times it's like the gas station drugs, the, yeah, the Delta eights, the, the Kratoms, the Kava, the, it's all the, the whippets. It's the random stuff. That's you really have to, as a center, go out of your way to get drug tests for and all that stuff, which we have here. Right. But on my end, dude, like I'm, I'm the kind of junkie too, and get and because I want your take on this, because like, well, for lack of a better way to put it, we'll just say heroin and crack was my main thing. Yeah, mostly heroin. Um, but I, anytime I was at a center, dude, because I've been to centers and and relapsed, like, but I just left. Yeah, like I'm like, if if I'm gonna get high, I'm doing heroin, I'm doing crack, and I don't want to be bothered. I would just take off. Mm-hmm. Where. I'm trying to understand and and break down the insanity, if it can even be broken down, of like, I can't do my drug of choice. I might as well try and hide something while I'm in treatment. It's it's a lot for somebody who doesn't understand addiction to wrap their brain around. Yeah. Why even be in treatment? Um. So in my head at the time, I wanted to move to South Florida. So I'm from Cocoa Beach. I've grown up my whole life in Cocoa Beach. So I've came down for treatment. I want to move down here, right? So I want to leave and go back home or go wherever if i like it would make it more difficult to move to south florida obviously you know i want to use the resources treatment offers you know when i go to halfway house pay a little less money for rent 
instead of three grand a month out here in Palm Beach Gardens. So it was more just I wanted to stay in South Florida. So interesting, pretty logical. <laughs> it really <laughs> like, is. Dude. It was just using the resources that were offered to me. You know, I wish I like I don't know. It's it's tricky. And it's so funny that you say like South Florida and you're from Cocoa Beach. Like yeah. to the average to somebody and they say I wanted to move to South Florida, it's like from like Pennsylvania. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're you're literally an hour and a half north of us. And I, I would love to move to Cocoa Beach. Well, Honestly, I love it there. The idea was because when I first came in, you know, like I went to um uh, my detox in uh Lake Worth. Uh-huh. And I was doing really well. Like I had the idea, I'm gonna move down here, gonna get a good job again. Like I'm gonna get set up, and then I fell into that cycle of using. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just gonna stop, and I'm still gonna move down here. So I wanna, I wanna ask you this question, and so I think we've covered enough at the point. Like you're, you're a junkie. Like you're 100%. a full blown drug addict. We yeah. can go into the history of everything but by this point i think the listeners probably can identify you're a full-blown drug addict i use opiates for a long long time and how old are you i'm 23 yeah so but i I do want to cover this before we because i want to then move on into the recovery portion because i think that that is the most remarkable pivotal moment too i want to know what was going on in your mind when you walk into this head shop and buy the very first cartridge of whippets, like what, what makes you go do that? So, you know, I, I I was getting complacent where I was and I justified it. I like convinced myself, I'm just going to do it one time, you know, just a little fun, little break kind of, I've been working hard in treatment, might as well treat myself. How much clean time did you have at this time? Um, I'd say 30, 30, 40 days. So free and clear of any, any, in, any mood and mind altering substances, 30 to 40 days. Yeah. So you're by far past all the withdrawals through all that stuff. Um, almost. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And, um, it wasn't in my head. I wasn't like saying, thinking I'm going to do this every day, all day for the next couple of months. You know, it was going to be one, one time. It's going to be different, just I can control it as long as I don't do it again. And it just fell into the cycle. I mean, we hear that so many times. Which I'm so disappointed with myself, you know, because Whippets, uh, what a lot of people don't get with the nitrous oxide, a lot of kids on TikTok, it's like a trend right now, the galaxy gas. It can really mess with your body. So I have nerve damage in my feet now because of it. And um, they're like half numb. So it can it can really mess with your physical health, and a lot of kids nowadays see it on TikTok, the Galaxy Gas, and they think it's not a big deal, and it's uh, it could be fatal. Well, dude, and two, like you, since you're bringing it up, young kids also like nitrous. Oh my god, please take this with a grain of salt, but it's like the healthiest version of it, the the one that you buy at the head shop. But you get kids that go to the you know go to Staples or what's the <laughs> other one. Office Depot. Office Depot. Duster. And they, they get Duster. Yeah. And I've known multiple kids, because it, it's not as quote-unquote user-friendly, have literally frozen their lungs and died. It's crazy. And stuff like that. So it's like, I mean, it, it's dangerous, dude. I worked with, when I was at car sales, there was this guy, I, I won't say his name, but he was he was a junkie. Old guy, older guy, you know, he was actually the guy that gave me my very first big book. And when he handed it to me, he was like, here, I think you need this. And I'm like, but isn't this yours? He's like, yeah, I don't use it anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So, but anyways, he was on, he was on Duster because it was a, this goes back, oh, 16 years ago, probably at this point. And, you know, it was older office equipment at the time. And, like, we had this closet that was full of office supplies, including Duster. And he would just go into the into the closet and, you know, do all this Duster fall out, you know, and what a great car salesman. But it was it was hilarious. Crazy. He'd be sitting at his desk, dude, and like hide away and you know, and you'd see him like fall out of his chair and then he'd get back up and <laughs> wow. That's terrible. Yeah. But so. yeah, we got a little off track on, on here, but you know, again, 
part of the reason Tom and I wanted Xander on here was because there were so many pivotal moments, dude. Like, again, we're we're sitting as a team and we're like, dude, we don't even know if we could take this kid. He needs to be put in a legit mental health facility. That's like how much damage you would temporary damage you would do yeah. to your brain. Where we're like, this ain't even a drug problem. Now this is like a kid's not home anymore problem. Right. Nobody's home between the years. But we ran into a couple of walls with you too. And, you know, first of all, we sat down as a team. We're like, all right, we're going to give this kid a chance. And, dude, I'm going to be straight up with you. I'm so glad I don't have my crystal ball doesn't work because if I was a betting man, you weren't going to make it. Right. Point blank, yeah. period. If if I could have picked any one person out of our census at that time, I would have been like, Xander is not <laughs> staying clean and sober and not finishing this program. Yeah. Point blank, period. But – one of the big things, too, I remember we sat down with you, and you were, dude, the, the cool thing was, was you were willing to communicate. Let me let me also say this. Xander is very intelligent, very well put together now that he's got, how much time he got sober now? Uh, a little over 100 days. A little over 100 days. Totally different person, dude. It's like wild, cognitively everything. But where I'm going with this is that up front, Tom and I had you back in the office. It was what, day three, day yeah, two? It was early It might have been the first day. I no, think it, it, it was like day. a couple days in. A couple like days two, in. Two or three for sure. Before I elaborate on it, do you want to tell them what, what I'm talking about? I mean, like I was just not in a, a place mentally that was good at all. I was struggling. And I uh, was like, I want some boxing and right now. It's only way I'm going to stay. I want to do maintenance. And uh, I convinced myself that's where I needed to stay sober. And... Um, they sat me down and was able to calm me down in that moment. I eventually got better every single day. I was working to improve, and I got to the point where don't need that, don't want that. So I remember you looking me in the eyes and you're, and dude with like tears just about coming out, and yeah. you and you were like, "When is this feeling gonna end? When am I gonna feel better?" I remember you asking me that, and I'm like, "Dude." You just got to hang in there. Like, I know this sucks. And, dude, I felt, like, powerless and helpless at that moment because I'm like, bro, this kid is going through it. Like, <sighs> you were convinced that you needed some type, type of opioid in your body or some type of drug to just feel good enough to, like, stay alive, so to speak. And I'm like, bro, just hang in there. This is going to get better day by day. It's going to suck for a while. But, dude, some some miracle, you heard something we said. I don't know what. But I think that you were, you were probably in that mindset, if I were to guess, the, probably a couple of weeks, the first couple of weeks that you were here. And the, the good thing about you, Xander, was you were very open about it. A lot of times when people come into the treatment process and they have these thoughts, these feelings, these emotions, they keep it to themselves and they just kind of, you know, as Ben says all the time, they get straight A's in treatment, you know, which you did phenomenal through this treatment yeah. process. Now, imagine, you know, we have Xander here. He He's coasting through treatment. We're getting good reports every single week about him and the therapeutic process. And, you know, his therapist is saying he's doing such good work, yada, yada, yada. But in the back of your mind, you always have this, you know, you always have Suboxone yeah. in your mind or Methadone or Whippets or Kratom or whatever. And you say nothing. Right. Today wouldn't be the same like tomorrow would be different than than what tomorrow is going to be. That, does that make sense? Yeah. Like you wouldn't be in the position that you're in had you held it all in, but you were very open about wanting to do suboxone. And I think the reason I was so open about it was because I wanted something done. I wanted something done about it, right? And uh, meaning you you were hoping that we would say, okay. You know, we have a facility that we can refer you to because you knew full well. Day one, I told you we don't do Suboxone. Yeah, no maintenance. And you were like, all right. Uh, and I'll, you were like, I'll stick it out today. And then I think the next day I checked in with you and you're like, I still want Suboxone. And I'm like, dude, just chill out, chill out. And then I think on the third day, checked in with you 
And then Ben was there, and I'm like, all right, come with us. And that's when we sat you down. And you were in tears, I remember. Yeah, I was. Um, and, I mean, that that puts Ben and I – and this is why, like, there's only so much people can do, right? Ben and I, in that very moment, there's nothing that we can do other than encourage you. Share right? our experience. And share our experience. And – Everything else is on you. And w like you just said, Ben, I think you said powerless. We were completely powerless over that situation. Yeah. But something happened. And then, you know, it, it over, I think the next probably week or so, you still were having these thoughts and feelings and yeah. stuff, but they slowly but surely started to subside. And I remember we were at uh, PGA National, and that was the first time I heard you say, I don't want I don't want to be on subs. Sitting out in the the pavilion. Yeah. Yeah. Which for me like it was like a huge deal, you know what I mean? Like gives me goosebumps now because that is what we're talking about, you know, when and, and, and Ben and I have been very open on this podcast about being anti-suboxone. Yeah. And this is exactly why because you have a 23-year-old young man who's been very successful financially like in his work and all the things outside everything looks great but you get wrapped up in this idea of being on subox maintenance when dude if you were 65 years old banging dope your whole entire life and like you've tried abstinence based you know a dozen <laughs> times fine whatever yeah. go but that's not what we're dealing with here well the other thing is too with subox and you keep an opioid in your body long yeah. enough let's say you decide to do maintenance for the next 10 years Bro, your body is so much more addicted, dependent on it. You've changed your body chemistry. To do that to a 23-year-old mm -hmm. off the rip, when clearly a, you're perfect evidence of somebody that can bounce back, I'm, you know, I don't I can't scan your brain right now, but I'm willing to bet your your endorphins, your oxytocin, your serotonin, your dopamine levels are all up. I feel so much better. And I would just like to add in, so with the powerless part, you know, there's nothing you guys could have done as long as it keeps me away from fentanyl. That was in my head. I was like, so I don't go get high and do fentanyl. So boxing is like the alternative. And now I'm to a point where I have so many tools in my toolbox that I can get through this being sober, you know, having defenses, sponsor, felt being a part of the fellowship, everything like that with AA, NA. Yeah. And our listeners know maybe we got some new ones who haven't heard before, so I'll just recap it. But like I have significant history myself with being on both methadone and Suboxone. Yeah. Um with that being said, dude, like the best way for me to sum up my experience with that is A, I was never cognitively as sharp. Like I was always dull and numb. And people that get on Suboxone, they're like, oh, it doesn't get me high. But that's like any other drug, dude. Like you build up a tolerance to something, you're not going to be high. I want the listeners to know that might not be familiar. Like, if you gave me a Suboxone right now after I've been clean almost 14 years, dude, Good. I would be nodding out, <laughs> drooling on myself, yeah. feeling good. Yeah. Like, it absolutely does get you high. It just doesn't get addicts high anymore because they've maxed out their ceiling for what the drug can do. Right. Like, it's because of a tolerance buildup. But they're like, I'm not high. I'm like, no, you're... And I can tell when people are on Suboxone, dude. What would happen if I took one? Oh, bro, you would die. <laughs> You'd what probably I... overdose. <laughs> can you? Can you overdose on Suboxone? You, uh, I don't think so. I'm, I, I, I'd have to fact check this, but I am pretty darn confident that if somebody was zero tolerance, because, it, because of the fact that it suppresses breathing... Like the, if somebody took enough that has zero tolerance, it could absolutely stop you. From Suppose breathing. if you took enough of anything, it could kill you. Yeah, you yeah. know, ibuprofen. I mean, it says on the label. Yeah. If I'm not, dude, we'll have to fact check that afterwards. But I'm pretty sure. Yeah. On the label, it says it could cause death. Yeah, just don't take it, and you don't have to worry about that. Um, so tell us a little bit about your um the therapeutic process that you've gone through. You know, over the course of 90 days, like what were some of the big things that, you know, you felt like were really impactful for you? Um, To start off, you know, first, uh, my therapist, I don't know if they're familiar with who my therapist is. Awesome. She's awesome. been on here. You can drop yeah, her name. Yeah, Maya. 
you know, she's worked magic with me. You know, I've had many therapists throughout the treatment centers, all different ones, and I've never done real work with them. So I always just like skimming the surface. And Maya is like, she's gotten deep with me and helped me in just all different ways, right? She's given me coping mechanisms, e- EMDR, different things like that. Specifically examples, I mean, it was all just kind of one big, me and with her, doing work with her every day. She gave me homework assignments. What about the community aspect? That was a big part of it as well, you know. I think being here, treatment in general, you make family, right? So I have a small little group of people here. Like, it was brothers to me, you know, family. And uh, we had both the Dylans, and, you know, I think doing this alone, it's not doable, Right. You yeah. always got to have, even if it's not sponsor, somewhat of a support, you know, being a part of the fellowship per se, you know, being able to call up my buddy, say, hey, I'm feeling this way. And, you know, just talking to someone about it. But the community ask, it is great here. But one of the big things is the size of it. Right. So at the treatment center I came from, there was 150, 170 people here. You guys only take a certain amount. So you get a lot closer with the people per se. And then individual t- or individualized uh, attention as well, I mean, from the therapy part of things, from you guys, the techs, you yeah. know. I I'm glad you brought it up, dude. As as much as I hate to say it, not all treatment centers are created equal. No, no, they at really all. aren't, dude. And and I mean the furthest thing from really. Yeah, dude. But that's why, like, I'm shameless plug. I I, I love people when they listen to our podcast consistently. Like we'll have people that will be like, I've I've listened to a hundred episodes and they pretty much know everything to ask and look for. Obviously we can't cover everything in one episode and like all of a sudden you understand addiction. It's impossible. Yeah. But if somebody listens consistently, dude, they know what to look for, know what to ask, all, like all the things, you know? For sure. Treatment can be very finicky. You know, we've talked at nauseum about, you know, the right things to ask when going into treatment and stuff like that. And, you know, one of the best things I think that this podcast has done for people um, that are even shopping treatment is, I, I mean, I'll be straight up with you, Xander. Like, I'll be sharing this podcast with other moms, dads, yeah. you know, that have children that are right around your age, you know. We got Xander. We got people like Brennan. Josh, um, there's uh, probably a Tristan. Good, Tristan, there's probably eight or ten, you know, young adults that we've recorded with. That that's the best form of marketing for us. I Joey's mean, doing well. Joey, mm-hmm. you know, and as far as treatment goes, we we're not. We don't. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We don't have some sort of proprietary formula to treatment. The only thing that we, I believe that we've done right is we've always kept the client first and foremost. That is it. Like there's, and it's no secret in the treatment world that some people are here for practically nothing, you know, and some people here, we get paid a lot of money for. Yeah. They all get treated the same. You know what I mean? It doesn't, matter like it, that's just the way that it is nobody's better than one another as far as staff goes myself ben the therapist the techs everybody is invested in each individual person in terms of their treatment like i'm not your therapist no. but you know what i mean like ben and i we could have been like oh he'll be fine no you know we took 30 minutes pulled you in the back room and yeah you know talk to you and like we could say it on the podcast, but in terms of treatment center, like there is no higher than me or Ben, you go to other treatment centers. You're not going to get with the, the, the CEO. You know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're hiding off in an office somewhere. Right. Crunching numbers. You, Xander summed it up in my opinion, the best. He said, you said you felt like family or you yeah. built family. So literally family. Like I can't express how thankful I am for you guys, but yeah, literally family. Like, yeah. bro, I, at this point, the, because the the relationship we have, dude, I'd give you the shirt off my back. 
Right. Like, bro, and that's what I think is important right there is we build real relationships. I'm just going to call it what it is, dude. I'm just a junkie at the end of the day. The things that we re- related is just because I used to put a na- needle in my arm, dude. Like, yeah. It's it just I'm further along in my journey. I'm 40. You're 23. Bro, you're going to be well on your way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and because we're such close family now, God forbid you relapse, we slap the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's no more Mr. Nice Guy. You sit on the couch, Xander, everything will be okay. Like, fuck that. No, we're backhanding you and telling you, shape up, dude. Come on. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned there's going to be other moms, dads with uh, kids my age listening. And I think that that was a big thing for me is, you know, I'm very close to my family and the damage I've caused through our relationship. <laughs> it's gotten better now, now that I am where I am, but it, it was bad, right? And uh, other mom and dads seeing that this is possible, their kid can come back around and the relationship can be meshed most of the time. You know, I think that's a great thing for them to be able to see, like doing this podcast. Yeah, and it's a, it's, I mean, it's a family, it's a family disease. You know, it affects everybody. And just a disclaimer: I've never hit anybody. I'm, I would not slap you. <laughs> I would want to verbally, verbally slap you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Any Ben? Anything else? Nah, dude. I, there, there's cases that come through here, bro, and like. People walk in the door. I'm like, yeah, you're definitely a junkie. You're definitely an alcoholic. But there's certain cases that jump out to me where where myself, dude, I'm just blown away at where I saw you on day one till now. It like it's it's you're one of those extreme cases. And I've seen other ones like it. However, you're one of the extreme ones that's always gonna pop in my mind when like day one, I'm like, what is wrong with this kid, dude? Like yeah. this is doomed. Yeah, Uh, really, I felt that way. And I just want to emphasize that because who you are today, the principles, the converse, dude, we have like adult yesterday. I'm going to be honest with you. I really enjoyed. So we we were doing a venture group and uh, you were pulling off, dude, and you stopped and I I was helping load up some of the stuff from the adventure group and uh, you stopped and rolled your window down. We had like a five minute conversation, dude. I'm going to be straight up with you. That meant a lot to me. Yeah. Like you made my day better yesterday. You really did, bro. And I, I really appreciated that. Like, and, and that's what this thing is, dude. Like when you walked in this door, I'd be I've I didn't literally think this, but you would think I would think like this kid will never be able to offer me a moment of peace <laughs> or serenity or anything. And here you are yesterday, dude. You honestly like made my day. I'm glad. For real. Oh, that was nice, Ben. You tearing up, Tom? No. <laughs> no. You know, and it's just I've been using for you know a little over seven years, and been to all the treatment centers. This place has definitely worked miracles for me. And you can get sober anywhere, but yeah. in this place it, it changed my perspective on it completely. You know, like I said, when I came in, I was still on the fence. You know, so yeah. Well, we're excited to see where you go from here. I know you got plans, you know, as far as your career and stuff like that. And uh, YouTube, which I love. Yeah. Go ahead. You can shout All out right. your YouTube channel. So um, I, I'm into Pokemon. My YouTube's Pokemon Z, P-O-K-E-M-A-N-E-Z. And uh, I do auctions. I sell cards, but I also make certain videos. It's very fresh. It's just getting started. I love to do it as a hobby. But uh, if you follow me on there, subscribe. That'd be awesome. I'll show you what it's all about. Pokemon Z. Pokemon Z. Pokemon. So this morning, right, I'm in the car. You know, today's my last day with the Rock, and I'm in the car. It's a big day, but I do my mug out. And I figured oh, I'd open a pack or two. And I, <laughs> I pulled a Charizard. Oh, uh, man. $600 card. And I'm like, this is going to be a good, good day, you know? Charizard. Charizard. Is that like the one to get? That's the one to get. One of the ones to get. Now, where do you buy these cards? So you can get Walmart, Target. Um, I do a little like series going to Family Dollars, like Walgreens, places people would never think to go for Pokemon cards. And I get packs that are five years old worth, you know, $25 a pack, buying them for five bucks. Why? Just because they've been sitting on the shelf and not selling? 
it, people don't know they're there because so a lot of times they keep them behind the counter, so people oh. won't even know. So I'll pull this big bucket out and I'm finding evolving skies and crazy stuff. Evolving sky? Yeah, that's one of the, like the bigger packs, so the more more ex- expensive ones. Wow. Stevie Buckets is all into that. Yeah, we that's how we bonded was you know I started going to NA with him and he does Pokemon and everything too. See, bro, that's cool with the community part, like yeah, I didn't realize that's how you and Steve bonded. Yeah. Like, there's just so much more to getting to know people and treatment. It's you never know what'll bring two people together. You know, yeah, we're we a bunch of junkies and alcoholics, sure, <laughs> but at the end of the day, not like look at that. That's beautiful. And go follow Deep Pocket Monster. That's Pat Flynn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that'll be a good. Just whatever he does on his channel, you do. Right. Because he's almost at a million subscribers. So I, I mentioned I went to a, a card show convention the other day. I kind of got plugged in with some of the big dogs. And so I'm excited about that and just growing. You know, I feel when you're passionate about something, people can see that and, you know, they're attracted to that. But that stuff aside, you know, tomorrow, or even today is really where the rubber meets the road. Mm-hmm. Sink or swim at this point. It's either I can use the tools I've gathered or I can continue with the same behaviors and, you know. So do you have meetings and stuff lined up up yeah. there? So um, I did a relapse prevention plan. So I lined up all the meetings we're going to do. Going to get a sponsor right away. I still have a temporary sponsor until I get one. Um, a coping mechanism. So I have a whole packet I filled out. Didn't you say you found a therapist up there too? Yeah, I, I just set the therapist up. She seemed pretty cool. I talked to her on the phone and everything. Like I went through a list, got a doctor set up for a psychiatrist, all that stuff. That stuff's important, man. A Extremely. Lot of, a lot of people with discharge planning fall really short, dude. And we really emphasize like our, this is what our therapists are great at. Because like you said, the rubber meets the road. Every All the resources that you have here... Obviously, you can't bring them all up there, but you want to try and duplicate as many of them as possible. Like if you're on any kind of mental health medication, making sure you have a doctor, psychiatrist, whatever lined up because you're going to need refills. You don't just stop the having a therapist to continue what you know, your meetings lined up, all that stuff, dude, that is very, very vital. A lot of people just are like, I'm done with treatment. I'll figure it out when I get home, figure it out here. You know, we got the internet, we got phones, like line up some appointments and you're good, bro. In the past, you know, like that's what I did. I left with like thinking I got it, you know, leave it on a pink cloud thinking like everything's going to be great, you know, relapse within a week. So that is extremely important setting those things up and just routine too. It's the small stuff. A lot of times like making your bed in the morning, like that's something that started me off at the very beginning. You know, just accomplishing one tiny thing of the day moves you on to the next and you just keep going, you know? Yeah. So stick into a routine. I used to make my bed every morning and then I got married. Now we, <laughs> we don't make our bed at all. And I'm like kind of to the, do not do as I say, not as I do. Keep making your bed. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't understand why. What's the point? I'm just going to get back in it in a few hours. You know what I mean? Well, I'll for t- me. For me. I'll tell you why, Tom. Why? Because at the end of the day, when I'm exhausted and tired, I don't want to have to flip the blanket out and make sure I'm completely covered and all that, bro. I can just nice little fold back, slide up on in there, trouble free, bro. Yeah, that's true, because that is always a pain in the butt. You're like, Because me and Amanda use, we don't sleep under the same blanket. We just never have. Yeah. I can't yeah. I can't do that. I don't understand how like my one of my good friends, uh Brian Wood, he was on the show not long ago. I asked him a couple weeks ago, I'm like, Hey, do you and Allison share a blanket? He's like, Yeah, of course. Why? And I'm like, That's weird. It is weird. And uh I just never could, you know? So like pulling it off of each other? Or? Yeah, just the whole thing. I I have a very I only can sleep in a couple sort, you know, ways and sharing a blanket with somebody just doesn't work for me. Me either. Yeah, I've always dude, all right, I I don't know how we got on this topic, <laughs> but literally to this day, I actually have a separate blanket even though I'm single that I 
I, uh, realrecoverytalk.com forward slash Ben is single. If you want to apply, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, uh, that's actually, dude, my cheat code. I kind of only have to make my bed, only kind of, because I actually leave it made and sleep on top with a nice blanket. Oh, so you sleep on top of a blanket. Yeah. What about you, Xander? Um, so for for a while, for the early recovery, I'd do the early recovery, you know, parachute. <laughs> Yeah, just just kind of <laughs> leave it, and I I sleep with one comforter, and that's it. I hate sheets. I don't or, like sheets either. I hate them. I wh- what do you mean, like sleeping with a sheet as a blanket? Yeah, under the under the comforter. No, I can't do that. No, it's, it's I don't understand the sheet. It sheets are shit. They serve no purpose. <laughs> it's been under my bed the whole time I've been here. Um. They're like, oh, the the comforter, the blanket's gonna get dirty. I'm like, so wash the thing. Are you a soft, like, fluffy pillow or a clumpy, like, stiff? Type? I think like a, a solid medium. You know, I like. <laughs> 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 I don't like too fluffy, but where my like my head's on the bed, basically. But I like I like some support, but not like a brick of a pillow. Should See, we talk I'm a about brick. Tom's pillow? I'm a brick. Oh, I got rid of that, bro. That was a whole thing. So I had a pillow. Should, yeah, tell Xander this story. Bro. I had a pillow. I just got rid of it probably. It's been a, 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 at least a year now, maybe two years. I got rid of it finally. And it was the same pillow. I brought it from Pennsylvania when I lived up there. Took it all through treatment, through sober living. And I got 14 years sober. And I just got rid of it two years ago. So you do the math. And I don't sleep, I don't use pillowcases or not, none of that. I like my pillows to be naked, like no, nothing, you know? This thing was nasty. He, and you never washed it once? No. No, you couldn't because it would get destroyed. One time my <laughs> dog, my dog got a hold of it and ripped the corner off and some of the stuffing started coming out. So I ran around the house and found all the stuffing that was like orange and stuff. It was supposed to be white. <laughs> And I put it all back it's in. Orange. Yeah, from just dirt and sweat and Ugh, gross. I, I know. That's bad. Like, and then I sewed the pillow back together. <laughs> I couldn't part with it. That's awful. Yeah, but then everybody here shamed me for it. Because well, I think I posted one day. I posted a photo of it. You did? Or maybe I don't know if I did or not, but I don't know how it came up here one day, dude. But we were like all downstairs eating lunch on a Friday, probably. When we catered the food in, dude, and and it came up, dude, and everyone's like, Tom, what is wrong with you, dude? Yeah. He's like, it's got blood on it and everything. Well, because I got all my tattoos, you know, in sobriety, and I and I normally, like, you know, have, I sleep with, like, three pillows. I sleep one on my hand, and then I wrap one in my arm, and then I put one between my legs. I do that. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it's got, it got, like tattoo blood and ink on it and stuff it was a really comfortable pillow <laughs> clearly <laughs> <In> my comment. <laughs> i don't want to like expose my mom or anything but she slept with the same blankets as she was like seven she still got the same it's just like rags like, you, a, don't even, you couldn't even tell it's a blanket yeah there's some sort of emotional attachment for to sure it. yeah it's like a uh comfort thing weston still has his does he yeah yeah well, this was fun, Xander. I'm excited for you, dude. It's I'm glad we got to do this. This is officially your last day. You just did your mug out uh, an hour ago and got to say your piece. Um, bottom line is the ball's in your court at this point. Yeah, you know what you do from here solely relies on you and nobody else. I hope to never see you here again in terms of a client. Yeah. Um, but definitely, you know, going to be running into you, come down for alumni yeah. and stuff like that. Definitely a visit. Definitely won't be a stranger. You know, like all the treatment centers I've been never stay in touch. Like this is something like you, like I said, you guys are family almost. I'm not going to be distant for sure. Yeah. And we're in me and my family, we're in Melbourne slash Coco at least once a month. Yeah. Shout we're- out to our therapist too, though. Cause I heard Maya and I, and our, all of our therapists do this, bro. They go above and beyond. Therapists at other centers don't do this, but I heard Maya say, the game plan is you're going to check in with me once a week. Yeah. Maya stays in touch yeah. with the clients after they leave. Like, just She doesn't have to do that. You she know? doesn't have to, dude. But it's because she's a junkie. She gets she wants it. To, yeah, bro. She gets it. Yeah. She's not doing it because it, it's like a job requirement. She does it because she cares. Well, and she doesn't do it for everybody either. 
you know, she does it for the people that, you know, cause listen, not everybody that comes through here is going to be successful. You know, I mean, the, and the cards are heavily stacked against anybody. Um, but you know, Maya sees something in you that, you know, she wants to ensure and she sees something in everybody, but you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You know, you gotta, you hold a special place in her heart and in our hearts and for sure, you know, we want to see you successful. So, I mean, so having a little over a hundred days, this is the longest I've ever had in over seven years. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, that shows something to say about rock, you know, yeah, in general. Awesome, so. dude. Is that it, Ben? Yeah, we better stop. We'll All right. Talk about something else random. <laughs> All right. That is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see y'all later. Pokemon Z. Don't forget. Pokemon Z.